Number two. For more than 40 years, the twin crawler transporters at NASA's Kennedy Space Center have slowly traveled the gravel track between the massive vehicle assembly building and the two launch pads at Launch Complex 39. These mammoth beasts that first carried all the Apollo Saturn V rockets have since borne every space shuttle on the last Earth-bound leg of their journeys to space. The technology used to build these huge, reliable crawlers capable of such Herculean tasks was deeply rooted in a region where giant machines excavated and extracted veins of coal. Engineers with the Marion Power Shovel Company of Marion, Ohio adapted the technology in the early 1960s and their know-how has stood the test of time. You know, one of the decisions that they had to make back then for Apollo was how to get the vehicle out to the pad, and they looked at rail, and they looked at the barge, and uh, both of those had issues, and then they fin finally settled on the crawler. And those guys that designed and built this thing really did a great job. It's a testament to the design and, and how they put it together that, you know, 50 years later, this thing is still, you know, hauling 12 million pounds around. When they built the crawler, they overbuilt it. And that's a great thing because it's able to last all these years. You know, I think it's a great machine. I think it could last for another 50 years if it needed to. It's capable, of course, moving the shuttle, all of its parts, and the mobile launch platform. I mean, we're talking about a 12 million pounds. The vehicle itself being 6 million, you have about 18 million pounds rolling down the road. And as might be imagined, it takes incredible power to move that mass. All right, this is uh, one of two 2,750 horsepower, 16-cylinder Alco diesel engines. On the other end of these are two 1,000 kilowatt DC generators. So this engine and one just like it on the other end of the crawler is what makes us move. Uh, these engines have about 4,000 hours on them or so. So for a 45-year-old, really a 50-year-old engine, they're like brand new. Uh, of course, we've maintained these engines you know, over the years very well, so these engines will go for another 50 years. So, with all that weight in motion, what's it like to drive a crawler? Steering wheel is about the size of a go-kart racer, but it's all electronic. It's all, you know, it's fly-by-wire, so to speak. It's kind of funny. It's, you go up there and that little steering wheel's there, but uh, that steering wheel turns some, some big cylinders, you know, moves some big trucks. So, that, it is impressive. One of the things about driving the crawler is you have to plan ahead, because obviously it doesn't turn on a dime. So you have to really be on your game and you have to be thinking ahead about where you want to be uh, one, two, three minutes ahead of time. The critical nature of the long rollout to the launch pad is not lost on those who operate this huge piece of machinery. It's very important that all of our systems uh, function properly safely from the time we leave the safety of the vehicle assembly building until we get out to the launch pad. So during that six hours or so where we're out on the crawler way, it's pretty much it's just us, you know, my team and the crawler uh, getting the vehicle out to the pad and it's, uh, it's, it's a critical time. With the end of the space shuttle program in sight, soon there will be no more shuttle stacks to ferry to the launch pad. But to those who work on them, the trusty crawlers seem fully capable of moving future launch vehicles if called upon. Seeing the shuttle program come to an end would, will be a, a sad day for us. The crawler actually you know, has gone through Apollo and shuttle, so it's been around for quite a long time, you know, 40 years. And uh, we'd like to see it maybe carry on to another program uh, if they give us the capability. I mean, the crawler's ready. The crawler's ready to go. It can take on, you know, whatever you throw at it. Number three. What is two stories tall, can lift the weight of 40 cars over its head, and weighs more than a 737? The Letourneau L2350, the largest front end loader in the world. The Letourneau Company of Longview, Texas, builds these giants to load coal, gold and copper ore, and other minerals into equally giant trucks. Well, this is a 53 cubic yard rock bucket. Again, the machine has a total hoist capacity of 80 tons. 
to put this in perspective, the 53 cubic yard capacity is equivalent to about five normal dump trucks that you might see going up and down the road. Wheel loaders are relatively young in the excavator family. In the 1920s, several implement manufacturers began building scoop attachments that fitted to the front of farm tractors. It wasn't until after World War II that manufacturers began making special purpose loaders. Since then, they've grown up. The Letourneau company has a long history building front end loaders. But this is the very first L2350 to roll off the assembly line. Near the plant, there's a test site where the machine is put through its paces. The need for the 2350 was born from the need to load bigger trucks. Um, the, the dump trucks are getting bigger and bigger. If you can move more dirt with less people, uh, that's the name of the game. Engineers worked for two years to design the 2350. Their goal was to build a machine capable of lifting 50% more than its predecessor. The dilemma that we faced were tires. There just was not a tire big enough. So we partnered with the engineers at Firestone to develop the world's largest tire. The tires are 13 feet tall. They're over five feet wide, and they're truly the biggest pieces of rubber that you'll see. Tuno builds many of the parts for the 2350 at their Longview plant. The company even operates a steel mill. That's what we have here is an L2350 frame. Now this is very early in the assembly process, so it's fairly bare. But what we have back here at the very end is the radiator. Now this radiator has a capacity of about 150 gallons of coolant. Impressed? Check out what's under the hood. Well, what we have here is an example of a very large 16-cylinder diesel engine. Now this one's turbocharged and after-cooled. It produces about 2,300 horsepower. And when it's in operation in our loader, it's going to consume fuel at the rate of about 50 gallons per hour. The diesel engine turns a generator, which actually supplies power to the four electric traction motors, providing propulsion. Massive 16-inch hydraulic cylinders lift the big bucket. We could dig an Olympic-sized swimming pool in just a few scoops. I know we just have to be the envy of all the kids that are playing in their sandbox. We just happen to have the biggest sandbox and the biggest toys to play with. Number four. Seattle has been captivated by a huge machine nicknamed Big Bertha. It is the world's largest tunnel boring machine. Standing five stories tall, it's digging a nearly two mile long tunnel underneath downtown Seattle. Absolutely, it's the way to go. Every city should have a big tunnel underneath it. Gregory Hauser is deputy project manager. With the older technology, it might not have been physically possible to even do this. Big Bertha, named after one of the city's early mayors, is 326 feet long and does much more than drill. Moving forward at 35 feet a day, it cleans up after itself, carrying rock and dirt out on a conveyor belt. Then it installs concrete panels, building the walls as it goes, leaving a finished tunnel behind. Best of all, for Seattle's drivers, everything is done underground, avoiding the traffic jams and irritation created by cut and cover projects like Boston's infamous Big Dig. Linnea Laird of the Washington State Department of Transportation. It's challenging, it's difficult, it's not going to be perfect, but it's a project that is going to transform um, the face of Seattle and um, technology and transportation of the future. But deep beneath Seattle, the huge drill may have hit an equally huge boulder or perhaps some long buried construction from the city's early days. Wells are being drilled to lower pressure from groundwater in front of the drill. Divers may then be sent in to find out what's made the world's biggest tunnel boring machine grind to a halt. Number five. 
is the oldest and simplest form of motorsport Three. to drive faster than anybody else Two. ever has. One. We have the world's first supersonic record, which has stood for 20 years. Still, the aspiration is to go faster. I'm a fighter pilot in the Royal Air Force, and I'm the driver for the Bloodhound supersonic car. A key global partnership of engineering expertise is going to do something remarkable that the racing community is going to remember forever. human nature to want to push the boundaries, to want to explore what's possible, to go to the moon, to stand there. Only 12 people ever got to stand on the moon. Generations were inspired by the achievement of doing that. And Project Bloodhound is about the Apollo shot for the 21st century, taking the record to the absolute limit of modern technology, literally pushing back the boundaries of physics. is absolutely unforgiving of error or inattention. We were expecting it to take three years to find a shape that would actually stay on the ground at all speeds. It actually took us five and a half years of cutting edge research. Because the consequences are so large if you make mistakes. This is about human performance and achievement, and we are all human. Aligning the way we think about risk. Does it need to be completely guaranteed safe every single time? It can't be, because you're doing things that haven't been done before. No one is perfect, and we need to allow for the fact that, even when we make mistakes, we're still doing this safely. The greatest excitement for me personally is to work with world-class engineers to solve these extraordinary problems. Bloodhound is very much a global project. We are working with the world's best engineering technology to deliver an extraordinary world-beating car. I think Bloodhound and Geely are going to make a great partnership. It's a company which has 20,000 people employed, 10,000 of whom are engineers. That's a high percentage, and they're doing some extraordinary things. Running six universities to inspire the next generation. There are four huge research and development departments. They understand the importance of developing science and technology. It's a dynamic, growing, young company that has that same passion for inspiring the next generation. It's exactly the sort of passion, innovation, inspiration which Bloodhound is all about and which we're looking for in our partners. Geely comes with that already preloaded. They're going to make great partners. to push back the boundary of human endeavor like it's never been done before. Number six. Ross Oboron Export and Russian Helicopters are presenting the K-52, a new generation scout attack helicopter. The K-52 day-night all-weather scout attack helicopter is designed to destroy enemy tanks, armored vehicles and soft skin military equipment, manpower and helicopters at the forward edge of the battle area and in the tactical depth, as well as to provide target reconnaissance, target assignment and target designation for cooperating helicopters and army command posts. Its power plant includes two powerful VK2500 engines rated at 2400 HP each. The helicopter uses a high-performance coaxial rotor. An important feature of the K-52 is the absence of the tail rotor, which significantly improves the efficiency of helicopter control and flight safety. The absence of power consumption by the tail rotor, combined with the high-performance rotor, 
gives the K52 a 20 to 25% advantage in thrust weight ratio over all known attack helicopters. Number seven.